First World Order Radio, finally, finally, we are on the air. No doubt. All right, all right. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. Begin on into some of that order consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows, giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. Seen in others in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. Proceed in others in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, get your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know our intention straight out. All right, so, I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient mystery school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories and shit that works. You have an activated pipe in which that produce this black chemical called melanin. We, what we did was gave a hard line in the sand between the different definitions of esoteric study and exoteric study. Playtime is over. Peace, peace. Ehaate, Washita East. Peace and love and honor to the world at large and the human family. This brother Fahim looking ill, filling in for Dr. Eileen L. Bay for the night. And tonight we're going to touch on the Constitution, the United States Constitution, and what you should know about, about it, and the Bill of Rights, and how it relates to you and to the rest of the uh, people in the America, in uh, North America. All right. I'm going to start off with the book called What You Should Know About the United States Constitution and the Bill of Rights by Dr. John Coleman. All right, here's what he says. Americans are entitled to know the constitutional history and that their country was established as a Western European Christian nation by Western European Christian white persons, and that the U.S. was envisaged and expected to be a culturally particular, particularist nation. Without attaching ourselves to this cultural particularist heritage in accordance with the ideals of the Founding Fathers, we never have become a nation in the vision of the Founding Fathers, and if we depart from their blueprint and go on in the way of a multi-ethnic divided nation, we will soon cease to be that people and a nation. Hmm. Wow. Let me go on. We have the examples of ancient Greece and Rome to contemplate. Frederick Patissiat, the great 
French philosopher put paid to the idea that brotherly love for other than our own kind can be legislated. Why should expression of our particular heritage be denied or classed as racism and bigoted, except to silence our legitimate right to be heard? When we dare to defend our traditional heritage, it is called reactionary and racist. I wonder why. Hmm. What is our heritage? It is what the Founding Fathers clearly spelled out and what the Founding Fathers of the Constitution called and granted. We, particularists, Western European and Christian nations, Get a load of that. <laughs> ah, boy. That's wild, isn't it? Let me go on to another page. Okay, it says here. Moreover, instead of being a so-called melting pot, what in developing in the U.S. is exclu- ex- exclusion Multiculturalism, and what each group group seeks keep to its own habits and customs, all the time demanding equal rights for its culture. Well, what's wrong with keeping to your own culture? They keep to theirs, don't they? I don't have to answer that. I believe you can answer that for yourself. All right, let me go on. Okay, you have here all the time demanding equal rights for its culture. In effect, the United States has become an extension of China, India, Haiti, Nigeria, Mexico, and Pakistan. Supreme Court Justice Field noted this in 1884 when he wrote that the Chinese have remained among among us as a separate people, retaining their original peculiarities of dress, manners, habits, and modes of living, which are as marked as their complexion and language. Five years later, he upheld the exclusion of Chinese immigrants. Can it be said of Justice Field that he was a racist? I believe not. He was, after all, looking to preserve America's Anglo-Saxon, Nordic, Alpine, Franco-Germanic heritage in the best traditions of the so-called founding fathers. That's not what it says here, but this is what I say, the so-called founding fathers. And I believe a lot of you that are enlightened or cognizant or what about nationality and birthright will agree with me 100%. Let me go on. This does not mean depriving the American Indian and so-called Negro of their rights, that they must continue to enjoy full protection and all rights according, according to the majority. However, however, those of other races who are being admitted must be absolutely willing to adopt the civilization, the heritage, and the English language of the Founding Fathers, as African Americans have done and not try to start their own colonies inside the United States. (laughs) Okay. It is now politically correct to talk of multiculturalism as a benefit. But what nation has had an infusion of many different cultures and survived as the original nation? Ancient Rome and Greece was not able to survive multiculturalism and neither will the United States, which is, of course, the goal of the constitutional anarchists based upon the Communist Manifesto of 1848. (coughs) And in pushing multiculturalism, the heritage left to Americans by the Founding Fathers as constantly under attack, and this is going on in our schools. Look at the report from the New York State Commissioner of Education, which is titled, a curriculum, African Americans, Asian Americans, Puerto Ricans, Native Americans, the socialist name for American Indians, have all been oppressed. 
This oppression consists of the fact that a systematic bias toward European culture and its derivatives has a terribly damaging effect on the people of, young, of, the, of the psyche of young people of African, Asian, Latino, and Native American descent. To correct this alleged oppression, it is worth mentioning that the kind of thing is not that this kind of thing is not encountered in the schools of Britain, Denmark, Germany, and France, but only in the United States. Asian, Hispanic, and African history and culture must be equally valued. Okay. Why not then equally value the culture of the Zulus, the Malays, the Papuans, Pathans, Hottentots, Bushmen, Iranians, Ugandans, Kurds, the Sudanese, the Kenyans, Mongols, Tibetans, Laotians, the Libyans, the Algerians, the Sudanese. Why limit equal value culture? Of course, what the report really means is the equality is to be achieved through a never-ending attack on Western European founding fathers of America and a constant vilification of all that are Western European descendants left for posterity with constant concessions, giving up, giving up constitutional rights by the original founding fathers group. Just hold on. Bear with me for a minute. Just bear with me. Okay. The pilgrims are explained away at the product, individuals and nations that were ready to discover and invade and conquer foreign conquer foreign lands because of greed, racism, and national egoism. Is this a writer writer Malif Kite Kimeya says there is no there is no a common American culture as claimed by the defenders of the status quo. There is a hegemonic culture to be sure pushed as it were as a common culture. There is more forthright view of multiculturalism, which past civilizations show fragmented into different cultures, unite but rather divide a nation. Veering away from his praise of multiculturalism, Camilla finally concludes as follows. It is in this in inescapable fact that throughout most of the history of the West, a con, uh, constellation of forces, including but not limited to sexism, is modern and flexible world invention of the socialist and taken directly out of what out of the hardcore communist. Hmm, everything's bling on communism if you noticed it. Okay, let me go on. Colente writings and racism, largely restricted cultural access to European males of the upper classes. But one can deplore and that and that still return with ever renewed wonder wonders to the great achievements of the Western tradition. A tradition as many observers have pointed out that itself created the freedom that allows its opponents to attack it. This man here he, he he believes in his heart that if everything, for 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 as European culture is concerned, this is what you should follow. The so-called founding fathers never found anything. This country was already here by the Aboriginal Indigenous Moors, which they got their constitution from. I'll get that into a later discussion. But let me go on. Precisely what the great constitutional scholar Irvin told the disreputable constitutional anarchist Edward Kennedy and Dean Russ. Social scientist Andrew Hacker is quoted by by Kamaya as believing America is two nations, and law professor Derek Bell says says that racism is a permanent and racism is permanent, and that American society is racist in its essence. <laughs> Kamaya goes on to say, "This is true. 
it is logically followed that if whites refuse to acknowledge that they are racist, they are in denial, which it is taken as a prima facie evidence of racism. Okay. These statements from the left shows how difficult it is to lift the issue posed by unlimited, uncontrolled immigration spawned by the 1965 Immigration Reform Act above a name call, calling level and to, de to deal with it without falling foul of so-called race laws, which he is right. There's no such thing as race laws and hate crimes. No such thing as a hate crime. You will not find them anywhere in the Constitution, in any of the four constitutions, which I'll get to you later on, on those, on explaining those. And it is therefore an ex post facto violation and a bill of a, ta of a tainter and therefore a prohibition of hate crimes. Senator Irvin's a position was that the United States could not afford to depart from its existing Western European culture and racist makeup. Wow, get that. But the enemies of the United States had other goals in mind. Are you hearing me? I hope everybody listening to what I'm saying. What I'm, I know exactly what I'm saying what this man wrote in, the, in this book. Because Dr. John Coleman is a European, so I guess you've all suspected that, all right? Senator Edward Kennedy misled the, uh, the committee on which Irvin set, sat. $500 would make no such radical changes, but the extreme case should set to set to rest any fears that this bill will change the ethnic, political, or economic makeup of the United States. Yet, a scant 36 years after Kennedy gave his assurance, there is an extreme change in the ethnic, political, and economic makeup of the United States, the end which is not yet in sight. The immigration issue is not behind us. It lies ahead of us. So, paraphrase, France Minister of Immigration Affairs, in reply to further question by Senator Urban, Labor Secretary Willard Witts works another unelected official said, I just want to make this point because the argument that the cultural pattern of the U.S. will change will change needs to be answered. Our cultural patterns will never be changed as far as America is concerned. <laughs> as for Dean Russ, his reason for opening the immigration doors why to other nations was that we had offended some of them. He said our relations with Asian countries were being damaged by our immigration laws, and he went on to ensure the committee this. We are not complaining about numbers, but about the principle of total exclusion, which they considered discriminatory. Well, let me tell you about the thing about that is. Well, sure, they want to open the doors because they want more so-called money. They want more dog. They're not complaining about the. Do you take, for instance, uh, uh, the border thing with Mexico and to Texas? They're not concerned with immigrants pouring over into this country so much. What they're concerned with the undocumented in, in immigrants, so they have a uh, documentation on them. Because each one of them is worth, I believe, last time I heard, was a million dollars. That's more money into the coffers of the elite. This is what they want. They don't want a bunch of immigrants coming to the country and they're undocumented because they cannot collect on them. If they cannot collect on them, they don't, 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 they don't need them. They'll send them back across the border. Okay? Okay, now, here I go again. Here Russ uttered an outrageous lie. Russ further assured the committee that the bill would not result in massive Asian immigration to the United States. Russ, uh, Russ assured the committee, and it was likely that he was committing perjury at the time and that the United States would not be asked to take in more than 16,000 Asian immigrants a year. <laughs> Yet by 1985, Asian immigration reached 250,000 a year. Unless this is checked by the year 2035, we will have an Asian population of 9.86 million. Or put it another way, an increase of 600% in 
in the number of Asian immigrants over 36 years. No nation can stand that kind of dilution and still survive as an original nation. What would happen to France if almost 10 million Asians were to admit it to their country? France, France will no longer be France right here. Now, the thing is, this, this country was never purely European. Never was. It was Asiatic, Aboriginal, Indigenous, Moorish, the United Washita, these are the Amur Empire. It's the oldest, the oldest Aboriginal Indigenous group in the world. Expanded from Africa and the first inhabitants of the Americas, in the Americas. This time I heard was about uh, over 100,000 years ago long before the so-called Christopher Columbus or Colon, which is his correct name, or the fictitious Amerigo Vespucci. These are all very, very, very late Johnny-come-latelys. That's why we have the Treaty of Peace and Friendship. Really, is to benefit them, to us. Because without that, they have to pack their bags and go back to Europe. And I'll get on that in the later, in, later on in the lecture. Okay? Let me go on reading this crazy book. Okay? We must pause and take note of the type of am ammunition used against those who fought to bring the, the truth about immigration to the American people. As I say again, stop right here, as I say again, they are not the American people. They are Europeans. We are the American people. We are the Al Moroccans or Al Moroccans, which is the Moroccan Empire. They are not sovereign. They cannot be the sovereign. They can never be the sovereign in this country. But because they are not the natural inhabitants of this land. But they took on the title Americans, but they are title Americans. You can read the book of uh, uh, Noah Webster's Dictionary, 1828, and they will definitely tell you that. All right, let me go on. They were falsely accused of harassment, intimidation, and the favor discrimination of all flexible words turned into flexible by the socialists and anarchists. Let me say that not one of these words is in the Constitution, yet they are used by courts on a regular basis as if they were. Okay? You can say here, so take the fictitious House Bill 2703. This bill purports to prohibit certain kinds of harassment against a person because of his or her race, color, religion, ancestry, sex, marital status, national origin, etc., where do we find the word harassment in the Constitution, which you don't? He's right, which you don't. These words, what you call, so-called, a form of legal lease, they use to trick you, to make you think that it's a lawful or uh, law-binding word, but it is not. Let me go on. It is just isn't there, and yet a lawsuit is built around it because of the wishes of stargazing, gazing, incendiary liberals who know nothing about constitutional law. Today, constitutional law anarchist Charles Schumer and Clinton use the word terror in the same indiscriminate way, even though it is not in the Constitution. He go blaming some. It, it, it was the communists who stated who started the use of the words like discrimination, intimidation, and harassment. And I'm gonna stop right here. He always talking about communism, Marxism, and all this. All these were created by rich European men. They always create an enemy, a 
against the people to create or to profit more so-called money for the corporate banking industrialists, start wars. Uh, 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 at, at the Bilderberger meeting, they choose who's going to be president, who's not going to be president. Uh, minister, who's not going to be a certain minute prime minister of certain countries. Decide who's going to win the wars, who's not going to win the wars. They control your elections, your wars, your banking, corporate industries, everything. So let me get back to this. Okay. Another communist word is dis, dis, uh, uh, desegregation. None of the words are found in the Constitution. They are inhibited by the Constitution. So many of the so-called civil rights laws are based on the 14th Amendment. But the 14th Amendment, for instance, never mentioned race. True, very true. As a condition for equal protection of the law, nor can anything be based on it. That's true. Because the 14th Amendment has never been ratified. That's true also. There is a mere excuse to make a case for special rights for immigrants, not of the founding fathers of Western European races. Hmm, I wonder why. Maybe because they are immigrants themselves. And if there's no maybe to it, they are immigrants. They are trespassers. Okay, let me go on. The 1965 Immigration Reform Act went a long way toward fulfilling socialist dreams and aspirations, as explained by Koken and Kishimoto, who demanded that the U.S. forget its Western European British history and pay more attention to Asian history and culture, without giving one single valid reason why the United States, in violation of its Western European Christian culture heritage, should aspire to be a world nation. Hmm. The 1965 Immigration Reform Act was revolutionary, and only Senator Irvin took like Horatio as the bridge trying to hold back the, the flood tide from India, Asia, Africa, and South America. This far-reaching piece of constitutional anarchy legislation escaped public scrutiny and public debate in contravention of the Constitution. We, the people, Oh, they the people, huh? Oh, okay. I'm going to correct that later on. We're not given any say or allowed to participate in what should have been a national referendum. State rights were utterly violated. That's true. This action has been repealed post-haste. Above all, the 1965 Immigration Act is illegal. It should have required a constitutional amendment properly ratified by all the states come law. Using arbitrary power forbidden by the Constitution, the Democrat Socialist Party majority in the House and Senate without public participation in the debate or consultation brought about a revolution in the United States. It was one of the dirtiest, most sneaky blows ever dealt into this nation by Dean Russ and his fellow constitutional anarchists and showed that why democracy has such a history of failure. That's not the reason why democracy has such a history of failure. Because a democracy is, is neither mentioned in the Constitution, which he does not tell you in this book. There's no way in the Constitution, not any of the four Constitutions, the, Constitution, the, uh, the Articles of Association, the Articles of Confederation, the Bill of Rights, or uh, the Constitution of the United States for America. Never in any of those in any of those articles will you find democracy, form of government. That's it. As the you uh, as, the, as you can remember, those who can remember in the schools, uh, every morning we go to school. See, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. To, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all, those who remember. It didn't say a damn thing about democracy, about, uh, about a democratic way of life. Okay? Let me go on. Okay, 
says here, the school says, history shows that diversity weakens nations, and eventually it is their undoing. This is what will happen in the U.S. unless we take decisive action against the enemies who constantly threaten U.S. sovereignty. <laughs> to the rest of the world, America is typified by what theologian Will Herberg said. The American's image of himself is still the Anglo-American ideal. It was at the beginning of our independence existence. The national type as ideal has always been and remains pretty well fixed. It is the Mayflower, John Smith, Davy Crockett, George Washington, and Abraham Lincoln that define America's self-image. And this is true. Wherever the American in question is a descendant of the pilgrims or the grandson of an immigrant from Eastern Europe. <laughs> I laugh at this shit. Oh, man. Okay, let me go on. Multiculturalism has a history of violent failure as one of the worst aspects of democracy by mob rule. Mob rule. Let me read, you to, read this again. And I'm going to touch on this sentence. Multiculturalism has a history of violent failure as one of the worst aspects of democracy by mob rule. Now, democracy, that's all democracy means, mob rule. Those of you remember an earlier lecture I gave, maybe about a month or two months ago, I have to, uh, uh, defined the word democracy. Democracy, all democracy means is a majority rule. You take, like, if I was a sheriff, and I have my sheriff deputy with me and just the two of us, and a whole mob get together, get together, and wants to lynch this man because he stole something from them. But me as the sheriff and the deputy sheriff, we represent the republic form of government, a form of structure. They represent the democracy, a majority rule, a mob rule. But of course, they can easily overcome us and hang this man. Although they didn't have the right, but they did have the power. That is your democracy. You have a democracy. Okay? Let me go on. Cultural diversity is a myth. It can never be sustained. It is a vivacious idea to repeat parent fashion. This country was built on diversity. <laughs> it was not. If there was any diversity, it was, it was contained in the mold and form of difference among the family of Western European Christian nations. Boy, can you get that? Non-Western, non-Christian nations were never considered by the Founding Fathers. They were never featured in the discussion at the convention. In any case, such as an idea would have been rejected outright, even if non-Western people had been a part of the population in 1776. Just in case we think that those other races now flooding the country are on par with our Western European ancestry and see what John Lucas, a Hungarian-born immigrant, had to say on the issue. Okay, here we go. The English-speaking character of the United States must not be taken for granted. The still ex extent freedom, freedoms of, of Americans, all Americans, all separable from their English-speaking roots. The freedoms granted by the Constitution and the conquest, prosperity, and relative stability of the country flowing there from were not abstract liberties, but English liberties depended on practical as well as sentimental attachments and habits of English law. Now, they call themselves Americans. Still call them, and they, a, a vast majority of them believe that they're actually Americans, which they are, which they are not. They're Europeans. Okay? Let me go on. There is already denial that there is such 
a thing as our Anglo-Saxon heritage, <laughs> which is true. There is no such thing. Americans are not being given the facts. Uncontrolled immigration made possible by the 1965 Immigration Reform Act, Act has led to a moral decline. Mm. A divided society is making for the degeneration of morality from which we will not recover. Liberals point to the recovery of France after the French Revolution, but that was only because France continued to be a single nation. Its people were French, not a mixture of almost every other nation on earth, as in the case with America in 2008. Okay? As Christopher Lash put it in his in his work, The Absolence of Left and Right, published in 1989, America is continuing the slide into apathy, hedonism, and moral chaos. Only by informed opinion can this issue be made into the hottest political issue. One of the, of the Republican majority in the House will be forced to confront as the Washington Post staff writers Samuel Francis and Paul Craig Roberts put it, let's regain control of our borders. Not since Genghis Khan gallop out of the Asian steppes has Western Europe and the United States encountered such an alien invasion. Not since the Roman Empire was overrun by illegal aliens in the 5th century has the world experienced such massive population movements of recent years. In the book, Citizen Without Consent, hmm. Citizen Without Consent now, a book, wow, Peter H. Schluck and Roger M. Smith state that we need to change the current utterly false notion that the 14th Amendment gives automatic citizenship to children born in the United States of illegal aliens. The gross distortion has no constitutional basis. Congressional Senate March 1926 pages 3 to 27 to 3 to 29. The Constitution has established citizenship in, the, in this republic in which race questions are not present and cannot be introduced. Therefore, no so-called Civil Rights Act can introduce race as a group or any other group either. He's, he's correct on that. Okay. Let me go on. All persons born are naturalized. I'm going to say it again. All persons born are naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and to the states wherein they reside. Okay? So all persons, now persons, you're dealing with the name persons. They don't uh, differentiate or tell you what what kind of person are they talking about. Are they talking about the natural person or are they talking about the artificial person, which is a corporation? Okay, all persons born are naturalized. Naturalized. We are we are uh, us, uh, uh, Aboriginal us as Aboriginal Indigenous people of the earth, actually are natural to the land. So we don't ever have to be naturalized. We are already uh, natural to this earth land. It is them that is not natural. So talking about natural, natural life in the United States, natural in the in the corporation, which is a British own under the British Crown of England. Or subject to Jewish Bureau or citizens, citizens Meaning of the United States, meaning they are the employees of the United States British Owned Corporation. That's what they are. That's what they mean when you go look for a job or send out a resume, whatever. And you, you know, on on job application, they say, uh, "Are you a citizen? Uh, are you a citizen of the United States?" Most most people would think that you're talking about. Uh, uh, are you born here? Are you legally born here to work here lawfully in this country? Country, but that's not what they're asking you. That's not what they're asking you at all. That what what they are asking you are you an employee of the U.S. the United States Corporation, 
but to their corporate. That's what they're asking you. And most people put down yes, not knowing what the what, what uh, actually what have been, uh, what they have been asked, than what they have been asked. Constantly giving away uh, their uh, sovereignty, constantly giving it away, and their birthrights away, which is a part of birthright 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 death of nationality and birthright. Okay, let me go on. The term and subject to the Jewish dictator rules out children born in the U.S. soil of parents who are illegally alien. As such, illegal aliens are not subject to the jurisdiction thereof, as parentheses the United States or the state wherein they reside. As children follow the condition of the parents, which is reside as, an, as another reside as another legal lease term or resident. You're saying you are a slave, or are you living in a slave state? When you say resident, residential, reside. Just watch for these words when they ask you this, when, or when you sign any document. Because that's their trap for you. To say that you are part of the U.S. corporation. Okay, let me go on. As children follow the condition of their, of, the, of their parents, that is, if the parents are illegal aliens, then so are their children, under unbearable pressure from constitutional anarchists. Dean Russ, Franklin Roosevelt, the Kennedys, the Messon Bombs, Boxer, and Feinstein, Americans of the traditional founding fathers, Davy Crockett, <laughs> George Washington, Daniel Webster, Patrick Henry, have been denied their cultural heritage ever since the event of the 1965 Immigration Reform Act. In short, they are discriminated against <laughs> And today we stand at the point of clearly defined by Alexander Hamilton in 1804. Now, the safety of our republic depends essentially on the energy of a common national sentiment, on the uniformity of principles and habits, on the exemption of the citizens from foreign bias and prejudice, and, as, and on that love of country which will most inviolably be found to be closely connected with birth, education, and and family. The opinion is correct that foreigners will generally be able to bring with them attachments of, to the persons left behind to the country of their nativity and to its particular customs and manners. The influx of foreigners must therefore tend to produce a hetero, hetero, heterogeneous compound to, to change and corrupt the national spirit to complicate and confound public opinion, to intrude foreign propensities in proportion to their numbers. They will share with us the legislation. They will infuse into it their spirit, warp and bias its direction, and render it a heterogeneous, incoherent, distracted mass. Okay. Here, suppose 20 million Republican Americans were thrown all of a sudden into France. What would be the condition of the kingdom? It would be more turbulent, less happy, less strong. We believe that the addition of half a million foreigners to our present numbers would have the same effect here. Were Hamilton's observations racism or bigotry? No, they were. You know, this is a question here. Hold on. Were Hamilton's observation racism or or was this bigotry? No, they were they were men. They were mere inter, intellectual common sense, useless words. And let us not forget that the basis of the Constitution of the United States, common sense. We have seen the problems unleashed by the federal government, rashly giving privileges to other cultures simply because they are in the minority. Okay. Stop right here. Okay. I'll touch on this. Okay, he says, he asked a question. Were Hamilton's observations racism or bigotry? Hmm. He says no. Okay. Tell you where this man is constantly coming from in his book. Okay. He says here, 
We have seen the problems unleashed by the federal government rashly giving privileges, not freedom, not rights, but privileges to other cultures. Okay? But that's what it, but that's what the uh the thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen amendments are. They are privileges. Okay? Let me go on. See, it says here because simply they are in the minority. The minority. Okay. But he never breaks down what these words actually means or entails. Minority means that you are a minor. You don't have enough sense to think for yourself or talk to yourself or to handle your own affairs. That's what that's what they mean by minority. They are, they are not talking about numbers, a small number of people, or a small population of people. Telling you you are a child. That's what they're saying to you when they speak minority. Okay? It's got nothing to do with numbers, but it's status. All right, let me go on. The Voting Rights Act, the establishment of the, the, establishment of the Department of Education, the Civil Rights Act, affirmative action, these things have torn and rent the fabric of American society. They have not made of us one nation under God, nor, nor engendered feelings of brotherly love, nor will that ever happen instead to paraphrase I mean, it says here, uh, uh, let me see, wait, wait, no, no, one nation under the God, under, um, one nation under God, nor engender feelings of brotherly love. But when have you ever had that? Even when they first came to this land, did they ever try to show us any brotherly love? No, they didn't. They showed us, they showed us lies, deceit, murder, rape, pillage. That's all what they showed us. It never shows any love. Okay, let me go on. It says here, we have become a nation of summer flies. Biblically, theism is expressed in the Declaration of Independence in the words that God has endowed men with inalienable rights. Actually, it's unalienable rights. Okay. This, but this is not the true meaning of the words inalienable rights. Hmm. The true meaning is that when the colonists left England, they left behind bad and corrupt laws and, li- and, and took with them the best, most honest, reliable, upright, proper laws with integrity which they brought a damn lie. This is still unalienable rights. <laughs> lie in the sack of you know what. All right, let me go on. If, the Amer- if America continues on the path of de- to destruction, we, sh- we shall have established rights for about 50 different cultures and languages, all of which will demand that laws and regulations be printed in their particular language and that their language must have equal rights in the schools. We, we will have radical pluralism in full cry, and this will give rise to a new threat to our liberty by reason of the demands that the inequality of cultures must be overcome by legislation. One cannot begin to imagine what kinds of legal battles are going to arise before before the year 2035 over rights issues. What I, what I foresee is an, an, an America sinking into the morass of rights in the name of democracy. Of, of democratic and multiculturalism and diversity as cultural equality swallows up America's America of Western European Christian white descent, the American of the founding fathers. Let me stop right here. But the dissension does not but it does not begin here. The dissension begins in Europe, not here. They have no dissent here. No such thing as a Western European Christian white descent here in the Americas. They are descendants of Europe, and really not descendants of Europe, if you want to really know the truth about it, to go deeper. But I'll probably give with you on another lecture on that one. 
Let me go on. The proposition here is that the West, Western European founding fathers, Americans, will lose their identity in order to grant non-Western immigrants rights which they did nothing to help establish in the early history of the U.S., a Constitution and Bill of Rights. That's another blatant lie, okay, which I'll prove to you later, of which they have little or no understanding and care even less. If 20 million Americans would full support Cambodia, Mexico, or Nigeria, it would be called American imperialism. William McDougall's book, Is America Safe for Democracy? said it's better than anything I have I have encountered. As I watched the American nation speeding gaily invincible optimism down the road to destruction, I seem to be contemplating the greatest tragedy in the history of mankind. <laughs> one wonders when Western European founding father fathers Americans are going to wake up and realize just what is happening to the nation. They built on this continent. They built on this continent now. <laughs> Open immigration is indeed the total, the road to total national suicide. It proposes perfectly clear that the United States is being turned into a global third world nation. It is up to we the people. We the people. Hmm. Okay. But we well, we the people. The phrase was started by our ancient foremothers and forefathers, not by theirs. And I will prove that to you later on in the lecture as well. To decide whether we want to stay on that road or get off or get off it is a matter of extreme urgency. All right. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna read this here. Okay, treaties cannot can, treaties cannot annihilate the U.S. Constitution, which is that the socialists tried to to, to with the U.N. agreement. It is not a treaty. For instance, the so-called genocide treaty neg negates the U.S. Constitution 100%. In particular, it violates the eleventh. Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which reads, the judicial power of the United States shall not be construed to ex extend to any suit in law or equity commenced or prosecuted against one of the United States by citizens of another state or, or, or by the subjects of a foreign state. Okay, the 11th Amendment. Uh, try to bear that 11th Amendment in your mind. And I will clear the 11th Amendment for you later on in this lecture. Okay? Now, I threw this chump's book. And I will read to you a lot of our history from the First World Order, from Dr. Arlene's book, The First World Order. And we will uh, begin with the Constitution that our ancient foremothers and foremothers brought to this country. All right? And this is the real, the organic Constitution. Okay? Let me go on. Okay? Okay? It says here, here's what, okay, Hold on. Bear with me here for a minute. Okay, here we go. Here's what he says again, and it's, it's European says again. Here's what he states. The cement that, bo that bound the, father, the framers of the Constitution together was, in fact, that all came from so-called white Western European Christian countries. This is no reflection upon any other, nor is it casting a person, a persons on any other group. It is simply a matter of cold, hard facts, which it is not. 
which cannot be presented in any other way. Yes, it can. I'm going to prove that to you. Now, let me tell you, this is an outright blatant lie. If I ever saw one, this is this is my words, Fahim words. <laughs> okay. Now, let me tell you, this is an outright blatant lie, if I ever saw one. First of all, the the people of the Long House, also known as the Iroquois, our ancient foremost and forefathers, Moorish, Moorish League of Nations, the Moorish League of Nations, the Iroquois Confederation, Remember our ancient foremothers and forefathers, the League of Nations. We were the original League of Nations, the aboriginal indigenous Moors, okay? Or you can say the original League of Nations, which we were, or the original United Nations, which we were. This is where the European powers have got the, uh, their idea from. This is where they stole it from, from our ancient foremothers and forefathers. Okay? The original United Nations wrote, they wrote the, uh, which is called the Kanyan Nashe. Kiowa or Kayanashe Great Law of Peace, meaning that everyone will be united, and which these supposed to be so called founding fathers copied the democratic ideals, such as the phrase, We the People. As I told you earlier in the lecture, it is our ancient foremothers and forefathers that came from us, not them, not the Europeans. Okay, let me go on. We, the people, formed the basis of the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. George Washington, then as, then as Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, not Richard Saunders, but Benjamin Franklin and others, were knowledgeable of the Moorish political system. It says here, you can read the book by Paula Gunn Allen. The Sacred Hoop. Benjamin Franklin, not Richard Saunders. Benjamin Banneker spoke on the Iroquois, saying the indigenous Moors have outdone the Romans. They have a social and political system so old that the immigrant Europeans knew nothing of it. Origins, a federal union of five and later six Indian nations that had put into practice concepts of popular participation and natural rights. Natural rights. The European savants had thus far only theorized. The Iraq, the Iraqian system expressed expressed through its constitution the great law of peace. Rested on assumptions foreign to monarchies of Europe. It regarded leaders as servants of the people rather than rather than its masters and made a provision for their leaders. Impeachment for errant behavior, the Iroquois, Chiroquois, Cherokee, law and custom, upheld freedom of expression in political and religious matters, and forbade forbid the unauthorized entry of homes. It provided for political petition participation by women and relatively equitable equitable distribution of wealth. The colonists should accept the Iroquois advice to form a union in common defense under a common federal government. Continental Congress For more information on the information on this subject, read the book The First World Order by Dr. Asuba Ali Nukapak El Bay and also the book by America's Secret Destiny by Robert 
Hieronymus, Ph.D. All right. Now I'm going to go further with this. Okay. To refute everything, just the European, Abion, Trump said. Okay. Here we have The Clock of Destiny, Book 2, by C.M. Bay on page 6 states, The Amazon Redskin, White Moors, Tawny Moors, Bleached Out Moors, Progress was guided by the cycle of the planets Jupiter and Mars from 1789 Common Era to 1933 Common Era in a period of 140 years. Mars pass, passes through the 12 signs of the Zodiac 72 times, and Jupiter passes through the 12 signs of the Zodiac 12 signs as a 140 years. This was 17. It was, this was. Thus, from 1789 Common Era to 1933 Common Era, spelled the rise and fall of Rome on a universal scale. Take note of the fastest symbols on both sides of the speaker's podium on the U.S. Congress. Uh, we're talking about the fasci symbols. They were fascist symbols. They just represented the fascism. If you if you ever look at the House Speaker or when they speak in the Congress. And they sit uh, the podium uh, is set uh, between those two columns, which are five size a five size symbol. You see them on the on the dime on the back of the dime coin, and your so called money. Okay, the next time when you have a dime, look at the back of the dime, and it has two columns. Those are two five size symbols, the same symbols you see in Congress. Okay. All right, let me go on. Keeping in mind the first eight presidents under the Articles of Confederation, they were prior to them under the Articles of Association, were Moors, and they were in power from 1774 Common Era to 1789 Common Era. When the keys of power were transferred into the custodianship of the Mystic Turks, so-called European Masons and Shriners that the Moors charge with the duty and responsibility of protecting our sacred shrine. Parentheses, New Jerusalem, Washington, D.C., and our science didn't, until it was a people arose from our state of spiritual, moral, and ethical decay and awakened from our slumber to reclaim all that rightfully belonged to us from their custodianship. The ninth U.S. President, George Washington, 16th, actually, or the, uh, he was actually the 16th president, not the first. He was, okay, actually was a Grand Master Mason under a tutorage of Emmanuel Mu'ali Bey, Bey Benjamin Banneker, as he as, as he uh, commonly known as. George Washington was the first, and U.S. president and Grand Master. Franklin Roosevelt was the so last so-called European president and rule in the 140-year cycle. Okay. Here we have the Constitution of the Empire Washita de the Mandia, more empire. It says here, we the original people of the land, sometimes called aborigines and indigenous, pre columns recognize that we are the Choctaw Washita, the ancient ones and remnants thereof <coughs> who now come together to bind ourselves together in love, to govern ourselves under the divine love, under the greatest constitution of love of, for God and of all of his creation above and below respectively for internet respectively internationally. It says here declaration we declare ourselves and our land to be a sovereign nation, imperial under the divine rights from our Creator, who set us here to rule ourselves, from the Alignment Mountains to the Rocky Mountains, and from Canada to the Gulf of Mexico, including, including East and West Florida, being created free and born, free and separate from all other nations, 
we have been declare ourselves independent on our own native and land, the Choctaw, Brown, and Tar, Colored Washington, the Mandia, our mound building nation, nation in the Af- in the Af- American call America. It says here, for, uh, for further proof of this fact, read Ancient American magazine, The Real Orders of America by Tom Strider. The Ancient Americans author, Paul or David Deal, included my scoffing, my scoffing in the establishment acceptance of an old world entrepreneur. Ballyhooing of a book he was uh, publishing, this initiation, the etymology of using a commoner's first name, Amerigo, to arrive at the name for our American continents. This, this Fox etymology was perpetrated in our schools until even that, that was dropped from many of its curricula, curriculum, which now favor items of political correctness in lieu of historical facts. Columbus' fourth voyage resulted in the said Spaniards learning about the Chanto Indians, work Emmerich, which means summit of the mountains, and which his, his crew, his, his crew Hispanized to America, the word that Vespucci's publisher, what was his name, Walt C. Mueller, used when he translated the Vespucci's book from the Latin Ricardo de Palma, related the story in Cartus, Salas Indias, written during 1504 when he was in Lima, Peru. His book is preserved in Madrid's National Archives. In a telephone conversation, Mr. Deal he mentioned that Amir in Hebrew, Arabic, also meant summit of a mountain, while the ancient Hebrew of Rick, of Rick signified something that was worthless, empty, or of no use, like wilderness. Amir, Rick, translated to mountain wilderness, likened to the Amerik in the Maya Creek tongue of the Chantals in what is now called Nicaragua. In other words, the original application of the name American, America, which both has roots in the word Maru, Amir, Amir, Amir. Amir, A E M E R, Amir, A M I R, and Amir, A M Y R. Hebrews, Arabic meaning leader, commander in front, peak or, peak or summit of a mountain. And the Old Mekan Mayans, Ik, Amak El, and in Algonquin, America, meaning more, 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 or more, did not apply to the Albion European settlers, invaders, or their descendants. Moors invented and migrated to North America from Mexico and became known as Washita, Yamasi, and the Binishmael tribe. The Bene Shemael tribe was a collection of what is now known as the Lenape, Lenape, Wampanoag, and Nenako Indians who, mag- who migrated to Indian, Indiana and Illinois and referred to themselves as Moors, even though the United States government continued to classify them as Negroes in order to strip them of their indigenous rights. These same Moors are related to the Maroons, Maroon people, Maroon from the word Maroonage, uh, or American Spanish, Skimaran, fugitive mm-hmm. runaway, lit, living on mountaintops. From Spanish, Simi, top summit, was a term used and referred to a runaway slave in the West Indies, Central America, South America, and North America, descendants of Maroons. Population are found in Jamaica, Colombia, the, the Amazon River Basin, and American states of Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina and Georgia, individual groups of Maroons often ally themselves with the local indigenous tribes and occasionally assimilate into their populations. Maroons, Moroccans, and Moroccans, Americans. See all where uh, all the, the names fits together. All right. Important role in the histories of Brazil, surname. So-called Puerto Rico, Haiti, Cuba, 
in Jamaica. There is much variety among maroon cultural groups because of different in history, geography, African nationality, and the culture of indigenous people throughout the Western Hemisphere. Maroon, Moroccan, Moroccan, Monacan settlements often possess clannish outside identity. They sometimes develop Creole languages by mixing European tongues with their original African languages. One such Maroon Creole language in surname is Saramacan. The Maroons, Moroccans, and Moroccans, Americans, created their own independent communities, which in some cases have survived for centuries and until recently remained separate from mainstream society. In the 19th and 20th centuries, Maroon, Moroccan, American, American communities began to disappear as far as were raised, although some countries such as Guyana and Suriname. Okay. Here is the word spoken by John Hansen. <coughs> Which was a Moor. John Hansen was the first pre- president of the United of uh, the United States of, of the Americas of uh, of America. Under Confederation under the Articles of the Confederation, which they served only one year. Okay? Here said the words spoken by John Henson on July 4, 1776. They may stretch our necks on all the gibbets in the land. They may turn turn every rock into a scaffold, every tree into a gallows, every home into a grave, and yet the words of that part, uh, parchment can ne- never die. They may pour our blood on a thousand scaffolds, and yet from every drop that dies, the axe, a new champion of freedom will spring into birth. The British king may blot out their stars of Catchet, Minitou, which means great spirit, from the sky, but he cannot blot out his words written on that parchment there. The words of Catchet, Minitou may perish. His words never. The words of this declaration will live in the world long after our bones are dust. To the mechanic in the workshop, they will speak to hope. To the slaves in the mines, freedom. But to the coward kings, their words will speak in tones of warning. They cannot choose. Sign that parchment. Sign it if the next moment the gibbets wrote is about your uh, about your neck. Sign if the next minute this Hall rings and with the clash of falling axes, signed by all your hopes in life or death, as men, as husbands, as fathers and brothers, sign your names to this parchment, or be accursed forever. Sign not only for yourselves but for all ages, for the parchment will be textbook of freedom, the Bible of the rights of man forever. Nay, do not start and whisper with surprise. It is truth, your own heart's witness. It is catch it. Minute to proclaim it. Look at this strange band of exiles and outcasts, subtly transforming them into a people, a handful of men, weak in arms, but mighty and minute like faith. Nay, look at your recent achievements, your bunker, bunker hill, your lexicon, and then tell me if you can... <coughs> If you can, that catch it minute two has not get, given America to be free. This is the words of John Henson. This is, <clears throat> however, the the real George Washington, Horay Washita, was his name, became an honor, honorary member of the order under the auspices of Benjamin Banneker Ben Bay, who initiated him into the LX at the Lodge. Number 21 in 1752 at the age of 21. This comes from the Hakeem Bay's Moorish Paradise. Okay. And also from the revised Encyclopedia of Free Masonry. Washington was initiated in 1752. The Lodge of Fredericksburg, Virginia, and the records of that lodge still in existence. <clears throat> Present the following entries on the subject. The first entry, thus, number 470. 1752. The evening of Mr. George Washington was initiated as an internet apprentice, received of interest amounting up to 20, 
Uh, that's 23 dollars with acknowledged. Dollar Craft and Master Nation, March 3rd and August 4th, 1753. Okay. We have here on the set of tree, which is the Bunker Hill flag, which is our original American flag. If you've ever seen it before. It says on the left hand corner in the box in a square like box. It's a pine tree. For everlasting life. Which the ever that's what the evergreen means, for everlasting life. This is the same Iroquois Moore's great peace league, symbol of the tree uh, tree of peace. A tall white pine tree. It has a watchful eagle perched atop, guarding the peace and the people. The four great roots reaching deep and to the earth, mother, and to the four directions, and the war, close of battle, buried beneath the tree. The trees symbolize the law and their constitutions. The branches symbolize shelter, security, and protection for the people. The roots embrace all nations of the earth and brought them under the peace and the law. According to the book, The Sacred Hoop, by Paula J. Allen, Benjamin Franklin spoke on the Iroquois, saying the indigenous people, uh, as I read to you before, have outdone the Romans. They have a social and political system so old that the immigrant Europeans know, knew nothing of its origins. A federal union of five, and later six, Indian nations that have put into the practice the concept of popular participation and natural rights, because we are natural people. We are natural to the land. So never let nobody tell you you have to be naturalized. No, those are for foreigners, those are for immigrants, those are for aliens. We are not aliens, we are not immigrants, we are not foreigners. In actuality, we are natural to the, the earthland, period, all over the world. Okay, let me go on. Okay, um, let's stop that. Okay. That the European savants thus far only theorized the Iroquan the Iroquan system expressed through a constitution, the great law of peace, Kayanesha Kawa or Kayana Ras Sakawa, rested on assumption forming in monarchies of Europe, and regarded leaders as servants of the people rather than their masters, and made provisions for their leaders, and patron for errant behavior. The Iroquois law and custom upheld freedom of expression in political and religious matters and equitable distribution of wealth. Okay, I read it already. Let me go on. Okay. The Iroquois Hindunasans, Moors, Moors, the five nations plus later one nation equaling the six nations of Confederacy or Iroquois, Cherokee League of Nations, the Cayuga, Mohawk, and Nita, and Nandoga, Seneca, and later Tuscarora, another branch name of the first five indigenous Moors, El Moor, Bay, El and Bay and Al, Al, Ali, Day and Shabazz and Muhammad, who were different descendants of the Olmecs or the Omens, Washita, Olmecs, Dogon, Malin, Kama, the Egyptians, Moors, Moors were depopulated after the slaughter of approximately 25 million indigenous people, which developed into the so called Five civilized Indian tribes, Cherokee, Creek, Seminole, Chickasaw, and Choctaw, which my great great grandmother was a Choctaw, Washita Moore. Her name was E Star. Spelled capital E A S T S T A R. That was her name. Okay. Not only that, I found out I am also bloodline to the Washita. United Washington, these are the Monday and Moore Empire. So I have blunders to them as well. So I know what I'm talking about, and I know if so are you all bloodline to this tribal empire as well. Okay? All right. <clears throat> it is here called the Devastation of the Indies. It was Dagan with Dagan, Rida, a Moorish Dog and Heron Hogan from what is now known as Eastern Ontario, Canada, who proposed the creation of the League of Nations. 
okay, which we know as the United Nations today, okay, which is our United Nations originally. Okay, I say again, it was Dagan Wida, a Moorish, Moorish Dogon, Huron Hogan, from what is now known as Eastern Ontario, Canada, proposed the creation of a League of Nations. According to real tradition, oral tradition, the League began in 1000 A.D., 1000 in the year of domination. That's what A.D. means, in case of those who didn't know. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people mean, mean uh, most people think, think it means, and mainly your Christian churches uh, believe that it means after the death of Christ, and you got some to you uh, in the Roman Latin, which is actually Moorish Latin. It's not Roman Latin. It's Moorish Latin, which means in the year of domination. The A stands for anno, in the year of. The D stands for domination. Okay? Let me go on. His spokesperson on the famous Hiwata, whom succeeded in bridging together the Senecas, the Onondagas, the Onas, the Mohawks, Mohawks the Cayugas, and eventually the Five Nations, and eventually the Tuscoras, the Scoras as well. It says here, read America's Secret Destiny by Robert Haramanus, Ph.D. It says here that the the Hindu, Hindu Nosa, Nosene, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right or not, which is called People of the Longhouse, also known as the Iroquois Moor or Moorish League of Nations. Of the original League of Nations or United Nations, wrote the Kayenashe Kawa or the Great Law of Peace, meaning that everyone will be united in which the so called founding fathers copied the democratic ideals such as faith as we the people on the basis of the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. Okay? All right. Tells you again that they, they stole a, a lot of our sciences. A lot of us, this is the reason why a lot of us have failed because we took on a lot of their religious ideals and belief systems. And uh, they took on a lot of our sciences, studied our sciences, and this is how we fell, and this is how they rose. Okay? Here <clears throat> okay, I'm looking at a European Shriner. He has a fez, which is called, actually called a tarbush, and he has El Bay written on his fez. In numerology, El Bay, the numeral. Value of 22, Master Builder. So they know who we are. The saddest thing is, or the saddest part about it, most of us don't know who we are. But around, everybody around the world, every culture, race around, or country around the world, or nationality around the world, know who we are. Most of, our, uh, most of the problem lies with our own people. You know, um, it's not a beat down or a put down on other religions or on other people's so-called beliefs or whatever. But what I'm saying is that uh, most of us want to be Christians, in which they are not Christians. They are title Christians. They cannot be Christians because our ancient foremothers and forefathers were not Christians. So we cannot be anything else what our ancient foremothers and forefathers was not. They were Moors, Asiatic, Aboriginal, Indigenous people. If they were Muslims, then so are we. If they were Islam, so are we. I, self, law, and master. Meaning I am master of my faith. I'm master of my future. Okay, let me go on. Here it is. The Choctaw numbered as high as a quarter of a million people before reduction by ravages of imported epidemic, 
disease and attacks by these Europeans, which they brought over here. Thus, diseases or sickness ever existed in this in this uh, part of the hemisphere, hemisphere of the world, world until they came about their diseases, their uh, syphilis, gonorrhea, you name it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I ain't going to name all of them because I don't really have time for all that. But I'm just uh, telling you, you know, give you an idea of what has happened. <clears throat> Here you have the Chickasaw, once inhabited the Nile states of North and South Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, Kentucky, and Mississippi. In pre-recorded times, another name for the Creeks is Muscogee. Muscogee is also the name of the language of the uh, of the large, largest group within the Creeks. Other groups spoke Alabama. Note the word Alabama is derived from the West African af dialect, which is mean Allah. Alabama, Alabama, okay. Semitic or Arabic word Ali Baba, meaning the Most High Father. For so whenever you see the word on different movies on whatever, and you hear the word or the name Ali Baba, that's what Ali Baba means, the Most High Father, proving that Moors, so-called Moorish Muslims, spoke Arabic not so-called American Indians, once ruled that the area Klosadi, Hichiti, Nashes, Yuchi, and Shawnee, often when people refer to speaking Creek or to the Creek language, they mean Muscogee. But the largest tribes who lived throughout the Smoky Mountains region, region including Virginia, North and South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, and Alabama, their language came from the Iroquois. The Cherokee were divided into seven clans. The people in the clan had to marry outside of his or her clan, similar in the name of for one group, which eventually left the Confederacy and became regarded as a separate tribe and was the original inhabitants of much of Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. The Ramapo Mountain people of New Jersey and New York say that they were descended from the so-called free blacks. This again. The Ramapo Mountain people of New Jersey and New York say that they are descended from the so-called free blacks, Moors, and the Tussacora. The, 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 the Tussarora originally was a group from North Carolina related to the Cherokee, Cherokee, who came to join the Iroquois brothers and sisters in central New York called the North Gate. Over, after over 200,000 of them were slaughtered by the Caucasians. The North Gate. You will see it on the Circle 7. You will see it. You, you saw it, but you just don't know it of the North Gate. I have to have, um, I wish I had, uh, well, I can key a lot of people in but I don't have a keyboard with me. But if I can, uh, it's on Facebook, I can show you what I'm talking about, which is the North Gate on the Circle 7. Because you know they have four gates of the Circle 7. Because actually sometimes we call it a Circle 7, but it's not, sometimes it's not, some people say it's not actually a, a circle. But it's still a 360-degree frame. But I'll get that. Um, often at a later date. Okay. All right. Turn to something else here. Okay. Let's read some more of our history here. Okay. Under the Articles of Confederation, the United States in 1786 then received a great certificate of incorporation under a different legal status from the Empire Washington de de Mandia. The Islamic Empire often referred to as the Moorish Empire by Albions, parentheses Europeans. This grant is called the Treaty of Marrakesh or Peace and Friendship and was made in 1786 to last for 50 years and then regranted in 1836 to the last forever. 
and what you and what you did, uh, uh, what it is the peace of uh, the the treaty of peace and friendship actually exists today, and it's greatly enforced and it is greatly alive today as it is. It has been signed, I believe, in nineteen. Uh, in the 1980s, I believe. I can't remember except the exact year, but they always uh, they always renew it because, as I said before, before in the earlier of this lecture, that is, if it benefits the European or the uh, Albions, it benefits them because they have to pack their bags and leave. So this continent going to leave willingly, you know. We all know that, but uh, that is the deal with what's going on, okay? But the treaty also, it relates to us as well. You know, we say like if we uh, decide to kill a European, then we have to be punished by law. Whatever punishment is required by law as well, as well as them. This is why the, uh, the Michael Brown situation here in the St. Louis, Missouri Republic this is why they have they don't really don't understand why they never indict officer uh Durian Wilson. They don't know the deep the deep reason why this is going on, you know. Because he call himself they call himself Michael Brown, they call him black, they call him African American and person, a person through the corporation they call him a person of color, which is a color which is following the colorable law. So therefore, international law can, uh, cannot come to his rescue or to his aid. Peace and friendship cannot come to his aid because they do not recognize that. As a recognize by Michael Brown as a real person. You know, so they feel what what uh, what do an artificial person need with justice? You know. It's like you have a artificial plant. Would you would you water an artificial plant? Of course not. It doesn't need water. It's not real. It's not a not a real plant. Okay, let me go on. Okay. It says here, Noble Drew Ali tra- traveled to meet the president elect Wilson, Woodrow Wilson. Others say that it was President Calvin Coolidge. And here he sat, and they had challenged him. Drew Ali raised his right hand, and light filled the room. No more Drew Ali asked the president to they ask him, are you talking about the Negroes? He replied, there are no Negroes, colored folks, black people. Black is not a color. It is an adjective and not a noun. Okay, I'm going to repeat that. I'm going to repeat that again. I want to repeat this again. Noble Drew Ali asked the president to teach, to teach his ask him, could, could he teach his people, and they asked him, "Are you talking about the Negroes?" He replied, "There are no Negroes, colored folks, black people." Okay, I see a parentheses. Black is not a color; <clears throat> it is an adjective and not a noun. Or you or Ethiopians? This is a Greek name for sunburned sunburned faces. That's what Ethiopia means. <clears throat> That's what we mean. We're not black, Negro, or colored, or Ethiopians. <clears throat> because that, that's a foreign name to identify our people. We cannot uh, let foreign, foreigners identify us for ourselves or define who we are. That's why that statement was made. Okay, let me go on. There are descendants of the ancient Moabites, all Moravites, who inhabited the northwest and southwest shores of Africa. I came to our flag of our ancient forefathers. Now let me stop here. What do you mean by northwest and north and southwest shores of Africa? Because all this was Africa at one time, or still is, originally. They called uh, 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 the Americas, which was Africa. All this is part of the the Moroccan Empire, the Morocco over there in Northwest Africa is the is the country or the nation. Over here is the Moroccan Empire. It stretches 
from here to Africa. Uh, some people say the Maghreb. Uh, some of the Moors, may, you may hear, <laughs> hear the Moors say the Maghreb or Aksa, I mean Morocco, extreme to the west. They're talking about us here in the Americas. Okay, let me go on. <clears throat> okay. The president stated, it is not yet your time. Ali answered, I have been appointed in due time by Allah, the great God of the universe. One of the president's counsel asked, what kind of flag is your flag? Drew Ali said, you have it hidden in your vault. So they went to the vault room. Here they began to bring out all kinds of modern day flags. Ali stated, you know it is much older than these. They began to dig deeper and came up with a red flag and said, this is the flag of Morocco. The prophet stated, I am here for the Moroccan flag that which you call a cherry tree. Then they dusted off an old flag that was red with five-pointed green star in the center. Now I'm stop here. <clears throat> when he said that this is the flag that he was looking for, which the Europeans called the cherry tree. I know some uh, some of you remember uh, uh, when George Washington was a child, he was supposed to chop down the cherry tree. But this is what they are talk, talking about. He had chopped down the Moorish flag, which is our national flag, which is the original national American flag, uh, our Moroccan flag. Okay, let me go on. It says here, then they dusted off an old flag that was red with a five-pointed star, five-pointed green star in the center. The president and council st started stare amazed at the exactness at the exactness of the Holy Prophet. The president, he said, we have had them so long that they will not follow anyone else and let them tell him, tell them, tell them would be like putting pants on a mule. The prophet stated, my flock knows my voice. After a while, he left and returned to his people. Okay. Now let me explain the American flag, which is the Moroccan flag, based off of the Al Moroccan flag, which is a red cherry flag with a five-pointed star in the center. The United States of America had made a treaty with the Lenape, called Nanako Moors, Delaware or Abenaki, in 1775, while John Hancock had been president of Congress under the article Articles of Association. Now remember, I told you there were four <clears throat> constitutions. The Articles of Association, the Articles of Confederation, the Bill of Rights, and the Constitution of the United States of America, or the United States for America. Okay, let me go on. Our ancestors gave John Hancock the Irish Celtic Moorish Rosicrucian, the name Karunda, which means great tree, and represented a general covenant. Covenant meaning contract. That's what covenant means. When you, uh, when you see uh, the Church of the Covenant or uh, the Brotherhood of the Covenant or uh, whatever, you know, that's what the covenant means. It means contract. Okay? I'll say it again, okay, and represented a general covenant between the old American Republic and the new forming republic of the Caucasians. Now, stop right here. Who 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 heard a did they say anything about a democratic form of government? Did they say anything about a democracy? You don't see it. Not once have they have mentioned the word democracy. Okay? Let me go on. It is symbolized in the treaty flag, also called the continental flag. The continental flag, I already told you about, with the set of tree in the left-hand corner. It's a red, 
the same cut, the same red cherry color of the American flag or the Moroccan flag. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And it represented, it says here, it symbolizes in treaty, it, it, says, it symbolized in the treaty flag, also called the continental flag. This flag was, was called the continental flag and it represented the ancient Moorish Empire treaty covenant contract with the provisional government of the United States. John Hancock was the president of Congress when the treaty was made August 31st, 1775. The red background is reflective of the Moorish flag, which is witnessed as far south as by Colonel Duncan Clinch and General Andrew Jackson at the further into what was then the remote west. Hence, Lewis and Clark expeditions. Okay, it's parentheses. The tree symbolizes the symbol of peace was the setter tree, which was sacred to the ancient Egyptians, the Phoenicians, and was called and the Phoenicians, which were Moors, also, and was called Seb or Geb. It is also known as the evergreen, symbolic of for that which is everlasting. As I told you earlier, it means forever. It means uh, forever life. They call it. Uh, the evergreen tree. It says here, and then get back to the Eleventh Amendment with this uh, European Dr. John Coleman. So everything I have read to you that you know now is a blatant lie. That what he said about. Americans, Europeans being actual Americans, that we have to uh, to be submissive to their culture and to their ideals and belief system. So he said we must be servant, subservient to them in many words. Okay, but we all know that's not true. He spoke of the earlier the Eleventh Amendment. Okay, then let me tell you about the Eleventh Amendment because he says a lot of things about the Constitution, uh, with a lot of things he didn't know. That he never break down words and legalese and things of that of that nature. Uh, <clears throat> he wants the people to believe that it's a European invention that it comes from. Western, white, European, uh, Christian values, which is a blatant lie. And the reason why I say that is because uh, in England, they talk of having a constitution. But many people don't know is England does not have a written constitution. They don't have one. So how the hell did it come from England? So you know that's a lie. So the ideals that they have stolen from my ancient foremothers and forefathers and incorporated into their, what you call their constitution. But we weren't in their constitution. No, they weren't in our constitution at first, but then we put the, uh, put them in there to show that we, as a righteous and humble people, And one people don't know is that there is no, well, the 11th Amendment has never been properly ratified. But he he talks about the 11th Amendment, but it's never been ratified, properly ratified. Anything after the 10th, a 10th Amendment has not been properly ratified. Why? Because you have to have a constitutional convention in order for the Congress uh, the House of Representatives and the House of the Senate, uh, which make up your Congress, to, to hold, they have to hold a constitutional convention, which a constitutional convention has not been held since 1791. I repeat, a constitutional convention has not been held since 1791. And anybody talking about the 11th uh, Amendment and on up, they're all frauds. They are fraudulent. 
That's why Prophet Muhammad Kuali told him that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment was not necessary for the salvation of my people. It wasn't. Because we are, he knew, uh, 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 as well as they did, that we already had a constitution. It was them actually needed to be civilized, not us. A lot of them came over to our country and to our hemisphere, not to our continent, continents, from the lowest of the lowest of low life where they came from. But it's we that had gave them the blueprint to civilization, not the other way around. It says here, he or she shall read the divine constitution and bylaws and point out and explain the star and crescent. Represents our salvation. The all-seeing eye represents Allah, and the hand press represents unity. Okay, if you've seen these symbols, that's what they mean. I know a lot of Moors when they read uh, their cards in the Moor Science Temple today, and they uh, <clears throat> they think uh, a lot of. I remember when I first uh, joined the Moor Science Temples here, and neither the Grand Sheiks nor the Sheiks or any of them could explain to me why they say a uh, of the USA, you know, uh, we are citizens of the USA, and they could not explain it until I found out in my, uh, when I did a lot of my deeper studies in the Morris Temple of Science of the world. I studied with Dr. Aileen L. Bay and Sister Kadira and Sister Raj Mariah, Taj Tariq Bay, and uh, and others, but uh, and I found out that the USA actually means Unity, Salvation, Allah, not the United States of America. Because a lot of Moors had got really confused about that, and that's actually what that meant. I uh, back to this book here. Uh, he says that the uh, he says here that uh, he talks about the in the first instance there is no mention of the FDA in Constitution and Bill of Rights it is not it is prohibition and then if it exists it cannot be law inside the boundaries of the Tenth Amendment <clears throat> and he's right about that because government do not have a right to interfere in state affairs like uh, Missouri Republic or the Illinois Republic or the Kentucky Republic. They have no right. That's what the Constitution and the Bill of Rights are about. It's a contract between, uh, I believe, 36 Moors and uh, 12 or maybe 16 Muslim sons or European sons, but he never, he, he never, he's never, I'm not going to never tell you in this book, not Dr. John Coleman's book. No, he's not going to tell you that. Do I believe he knows the truth? Let me finish reading this sentence uh, here. And even if it existed, it could not be law inside the boundaries of the Tenth Amendment, which it cannot. Therefore, anything the FDI enacts. Is no law at all, which is not, because it lacks constitutional empowerment. It does, in the same way as the FBI, which the FBI does. The FBI can only operate in Washington, D.C., and within the boundaries of that, of that radius. They cannot operate, they cannot lawfully operate outside of that. Most, the majority of people don't know that. But then again, where do you see FBI or Federal Bureau of Investigation in the Constitution? You don't. All these are unlawful organiz- or law- or law- so-called law enforcement agencies. The Bureau of Alcohol and Tobacco is unlawful. And other government, so-called government agencies have no constitutional mandate and have no authority to operate in the, in the several states. They don't. So, you know, the thing is, 
dealing with the Constitution, all I can advise you to do, if you can, order the book The First World Order by by Dr. Nutapak Il Bay, and order The Moorish Paradigm by Dr. Hakeem Bay. And you will find out a lot of things I've told you was true. And pretty soon they're getting ready to cut me off. I wish I had more time to give this lecture. But if you want to contact Dr. Aileen or talk to myself, my phone number is 314-644-4425, St. Louis, Missouri Republic. Dr. Aileen's number is 910-364-9099. No, so, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Constitution, and always remember, it is our Constitution and not the European's Constitution. It never was the European Constitution. It's set up by the Iroquois Confederation of Moors. And I'll sound off to you tonight. Peace and love to all of you and the rest of the human family. Much love to you. Tay Washita East.